All right, good evening. Hopefully we got this sorted out with Instagram and our guests will be joining very shortly. Fingers crossed. Yay. Hi. <laughs> I was over here like six times the charm. <laughs> yeah. All right. You can see me okay? Yes, fantastic. Hi, Tishan. Hi, friends. <laughs> I haven't spoken to you in such a long time. Yeah, I know. How's it going? It's going pretty good. Um, I mean, I have no complaints. Marriage is good. Everything is good. Life is good. How about you? Everything's fine. Um, you know, I'm so consumed with work, so I'm trying to balance. So I'm getting back into my charity work, which I love. Okay, that's you know, I good. Love to say I promise this year. Right. I'm really make. I mean, you know, the COVID had us locked in and not embracing each other physically. But um, my charity work is starting up again. And so That's I'm good. happy that I'm getting back out there because I feel that it gives me joy. Yeah. You know, yeah. Gives- and balance is so important. I mean, we, I mean, I think, I don't know, I don't know, I can't say anything about men, but for us women, <laughs> we juggle so much and it's, it's hard, as simple as it is, it's so hard to just stop and take a breather. But that yeah, balance is. is so super important. Like someone, like people always say, how can you take care of others unless you take care of yourself first? Indeed, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So that's um, Hands for Hunger. And who, who else do you normally volunteer with? Mahama's Crisis Center. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Okay, good. Awesome. And they absolutely need volunteers more now than ever. Yeah, for sure. The need is so great apart from the counseling, you know, for the, the domestic violence and other um, social issues associated with that, you know, the need has spread to housing, food, clothing. Yeah. So when you have a client who comes to us, you know, they may have to be displaced. And right. so uniforms, clothes, baby food, baby items, you yeah. know, everything they need to exist as a whole person and a family. Mm-hmm. So we find ourselves having to do more of that. And so we have to reach out to our social partners to give more, you know. Right. It's a community and the government also um, helps along with that. But it's that's a whole nother conversation. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, I, I appreciate you so much for coming on the call. I know you're super busy. Um, so I appreciate you taking the time out. Um, but like I said, it's, this is going to be straight up conversational. Um, unfortunately, we, because we had our technical errors, we had a few, a few people trickling in in the beginning, and I obviously had to okay. restart it. So hopefully, more people come trickling in. Um, but this is just you know a catch up. Um, but for those who will be watching the rebroadcast, the craft is a candid conversation with creatives like our guest Lindsay Thompson, who is a veteran journalist, uh, a communication strategist. That's how I like to put it. Um, but you have been in the journalism industry for decades, not to put age on you, but <laughs> she is, I would say before there were any of the people who are on, who is, who you see in the headlines or even on TV, as far as newscasts go, Lindsay has come before all of them. Um, she is seasoned, um, as many, um, reputable journalists would, would coined it, um, I know how I started, and it's so funny how I started journalism is with you, but we're not going to get into that yes. just yet. I want to talk more about you and how did you, how did you get drawn into journalism? Well, looking back, you know, putting it all in, um, you know, comprehensively, I think journalism picked me. Um, let me explain. Hey, during high school, I went to Aquinas College. And I've always loved and excelled in the arts, you know, literature, drama, and of course, English English language. Mm -hmm. And I also worked for our school newspaper. However, when I went off to college, my first major was teaching. I thought I was going to be a teacher. You couldn't tell me I was not called to be a teacher. Okay, so teaching, then business. But it was really not until I enrolled in the arts and journalism 101 that my interest in journalism really grew. So, but still, I focus on social problems. I still didn't, I don't know if I was afraid of it or 
I guess I uh, had some other ideas in my mind of what I was going to be. You know, when you go to college, you change your majors maybe once or twice before you really decide on what you want to pursue as a career. Right. But still, it wasn't until I returned home and my first for journalism grew to the point where I just couldn't see myself doing anything else. Wow. Um, wanted to know things, you know. It, it came like a natural knack for me being inquisitive or nosy, you know, as we say locally, uh, wanting to know people, wanting to know about people, who they are, what they are doing, and why. That That's one of my most prevalent questions, why? Right. And just the thrill, the thrill of getting that information firsthand and then relaying it to the public. So that was the major attraction for me, you know, almost like a love affair, you know. And so that that's how it really grew on me and grew within me. And so I started out at the Nassau Guardian. It was a while ago, in 1990, actually. Uh, I spent 14 years there. And I have now transitioned into a government publicist, if you want to call, call us that, um, at Bahamas Information Services. So I, I've been there about 17 years now. So in total, I've been, you know, in the craft, in the profession for 30 odd years. Um, so I've, I've done, I've done both. I've done the reporter both editor That's sides and now I, I'm working in, in, in government. And so it, it's, it's, it's telling the same story but in a different format and about, well, it's telling a story in a different format and about other people. <laughs> right. If, if, if you mean, yeah, so yeah. But um, yeah, the attraction is still there. Um, I still have a hunger for it, um, even though I'm in government. Um, the chase is different. Yeah. You know, yeah, government, yeah. government, we're giving the information to craft. Right. You're the right. It, it is still a chase. I never really thought about that. That is true. It is still yeah, a chase. <laughs> yeah, the chase is different. Um, I, 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 at the newspaper, you know, we had to go get that story, you know, I, the hunger and the drive to get the answers from those who, who should be held accountable. Right. So now I'm packaging, I'm packaging the information from those who should be held accountable to disseminate to the masses. So, so, it's, so it's a different um, dynamics at play right now. Mm -hmm. Understood. Okay, so I want to get into how do we know each other? Like I alluded to earlier, my first taste of journalism was introduced by you. That's so weird. Um, I but, know. Uh, right? <laughs> but I was fresh out of high school. I actually want I don't. I don't know if I, if I ever told you this, but I actually wanted to be a screenplay writer. I was passionate okay. about movies. I think I mean, I, maybe we talked about that. Okay. Yeah. okay. Yes. I was passionate about writing movies and, and being a playwright and, you know, writing movie scripts. And so my plan in my 17 year old mind was that I was going to, until I had enough money saved up for college and before I could go off to school, I would do something as close to that as possible, which was developing my writing skills or developing a writing style and the way I thought I would do that is to work at a newspaper and so when I had the opportunity to intern there you know the government I don't know if they still have it but the government had a internship program for high schoolers senior senior high school students where you could intern in an area where you may have had interest and it was me and a few other students who interned at the NASA Guardian I was the only one was Kelsey who, Kelsey there as well Kelsey no. Johnson. No, no, no. Okay. I think I think Kelsey Johnson went to GHS. I went to CI Gibson. Okay. Um, and I I, I want to say I was a few years ahead of her too. Uh, but in any event, I interned at the Guardian. I was the only one in the newsroom. And Miss Oswell Brown had me shifting through old newspapers and I was super <laughs> bored. I was super. I felt so unchallenged. <laughs> and I remember like if it was like, I can't remember how long the program was, but let's just say the program was like four weeks. My last week, I remember thinking, man, I made a mistake. I shouldn't have done this. You know, maybe I need to think this whole plan, you know, over whatever the case might be. And then finally, I think he or someone else was like, Lindsay, why don't you take the intern with you to your assignment? And I was like, <gasps> <laughs> I was like, like you chase us. 
<laughs> you took me with you. And yeah. what I appreciated so much was that I didn't know what all went into journalism. You know, I just yeah. thought you wrote. I just thought I just thought you sat be, you know, you sat behind a computer and you write a story and that was it. I didn't know you went out to assignments and you got and you got information and you did research. You know, you went through the morgue and the archives to get, you know, research and background story and all that stuff. And, you know, I didn't know all that all of that that were the different parts of getting a story together. And me shadowing you, I can't remember the assignment, but we went to the Hilton. I remember we went I remember the parking lot, you put your makeup on. And you acted like I wasn't even there. Like you did not have time for me at all. And he was putting your makeup on and da 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 and and you just like stay close to me. Whatever I do, you do. And I just I shadowed you. I watched on your element. Like you wasn't babysitting me at all. Because you was interviewing, you had to do you went and you got what you had to get. And you came back and you wrote your story. And I remember looking at that whole introduction of what it is that you guys do. And I was like, Yeah, this is it. This is what I want to do. This is like you said, it's the chase. And mm -hmm. I remember thinking when I graduate, I already interned there. I'm gonna go ahead and get a job at the Nassau Guardian. Of course, it was a lot of nagging. And Dr. I mean, um, uh, Mr. Oswald Brown definitely took a chance on me because I was 17 years old, no degree, mm -hmm. no experience, young, fresh, and green for real. And, you know, you took me under your wing, you and a few others, but it was particularly you in terms of grooming me into a woman professional. I guess you're young, but you don't have to, you know, carry yourself like you're a teenager. You know, you don't have to present yourself like you were a teenager. So that in particular, I really appreciate. Well, you know, um, I, I remember, I vividly remember, or I, I clearly remember um, when you interned at the Nassau Guardian. And, um, you know, I always say yes, we, we go to college, we, we get exposure, but I'm telling you, the real, real journalism exposure is in that newsroom. Yeah. Um, when, I, like, when I first joined, there was Chris Simonet, you know, he was the editor at the Nassau Guardian, hands on. You came back into the newsroom and you show him your script and he was still old school. He was still doing shorthand and he still had the red, the red the red pen and the red ink. Oh, yeah, yeah. He would go through, he would go through it, right? Mm -hmm. And then eventually, even, and then we had institutional memory. We had Clunas Devaney. Um, that was Anthony Capron. And Glass One Person at the time was still at the Tribune. But whenever I encountered him on an assignment, I just, I just latched on to him. Athena Damianos. She actually taught me how to write parliamentary news. And she was at the Tribune. So what I did, whenever I was assigned to the House of Assembly and I saw her, I made sure I sat right next to her. And I know at times I was annoying, right? Because every time something happened, I'd be like, Athena, Athena, what's happening? What are they doing? What are they, like, they mean that at? <laughs> you know? she, like, she would be like, hold on one second, Lindsay, let me get this first. So whenever I went to the House of Assembly, I really looked to see if she was there. And I sat right next to her. She was at the Tribune. I was at the Guardian, but to me, I didn't care, <laughs> okay? I wanted to learn what she knew. I wanted to learn from Glassman Thurston, and even the photographers. We had some of the best photographers in the profession. Yes. When I joined the photo, we were still printing in black and white. We were still going into the dark room. Wow. There was um, Derek Smith, Donald, Donald Knowles, Andrew Seymour. You know, sometimes we went into the dark room because, you know, when you're in a newspaper, it's multifaceted. And you can learn anything you want to learn. Newspaper production, photography, um, reporting, you know, into the, the classified ad section or all the ad section, printing department. So you can learn anything at a newspaper. Um, right. Just take your pick. Right. And so for me, for me, once I got into that newsroom, the drive and the hunger it just it just blossomed and my my colleagues my fellow reporters tanya smith cartwright lakel lakel turnpfess pauline seymour um robin adderley you know all of us lisa strawn i mean andrew coakley we put in some tall tall hours we put in long hours at, at yeah. the paper and 
I think it, it made us like work. Bad, yeah, it made us better journalists because now those names who are called were either working in government or a lawyer, you know, or the printing our own printing That's company. True. So so we've done well. Um, and then eventually um, the likes of Erica Wells and Candia Dames. And, um, you know, they, they came on board a few years later, but we were still very young. Um, so we, we weren't too far apart in terms of getting to know each other and learning from each other. Yeah. And so it was Vanessa a beautiful Clark, Keva. Yes. Yes. Um, Leticia, Leticia, my sweetie. Right, right, right. right, right. right. Patrick Hanna, Leticia Henderson, Derek Smith, Peter Ramsey. So we met all of those people along the way. And if you if you didn't try to learn something from those who were there before you, then you know, why get into the profession? It, it, it's yeah. such a crafty and noble and exciting profession, you know. And how I see it, the older you are, the better you are, you know. If if, if I were in a position to a newspaper or, or a broadcast company the older you are you're not going anywhere because right. you've learned so much and what i refer to as institutional memory you can i mean you can't pay for that how could you let that go you know as long as the person has you know their faculties about them they have the insight you know they can tell you about um what's going on in the country from even before some of us were born mm -hmm. so when coolness and Anthony Capron and Gladstone Thurston, when all of them were in the newsroom at the same time, I mean, if you didn't take advantage of that, then, yeah. you know, that was something. And then also Brown, of course. Um, Mr. Brown was, was, was a reporter's editor. That's, that's how I saw him. He, you couldn't tell him how to run his newsroom, you know. Um, many times, you know, he would butt head with the publisher I mean, you know, these are my reporters, you know, I'm going to stand up for them. And Mr. Brown was part of the, I guess, innovative change um, under Patrick Walks. You know, under Mr. Walks, we all went, we all went back to school. We all went up, we all went away for training. Wow. You know, so Mr. Walks made sure that um, we were equipped to handle the, the changing, um, the changing face of, of the newspaper and technology, you know, yeah. look, look today. You know? Yes, yes. Yeah, I, I used to call it uh, a walking, talking encyclopedia or bohemian encyclopedia. That's what those guys um, were for me. Like, I mean, yes. I guess in a way it, it, it encouraged a bit of, you know, leaning on them probably a little too much. But I also didn't have a problem diving into the archives either to find out the backstory yes. and research. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's funny because, you know, journalism can be a bit competitive. It can be a bit cutthroat. Yes. But, you know, mm -hmm. I didn't get that from the family at the NASA Guardian, which is super valuable, especially when you are, you know, young and green and you don't really, you're still navigating, especially for someone like a young writer. You're still trying to figure out your style. So I, I know about the red pen. I remember um, <laughs> the copy editor, I can't think of his first name, but Mr. Simonet, I always call him Mr. Simonet. Yeah, um, yeah, may he rest in peace. Uh, he was brutal on the red pen, boy. You know, yes, but it yes. caused you to be super humble. Right. <laughs> I know. Hey, right. when you think you wrote this masterpiece, right? Um, Glasson used to do that to me, you know. He'd be like, GT, I say, GT, come, come look at this for me. And he'd be like, Lindsay. <laughs> then he'll start, him. you know. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, you know, the, the thing is, you know, if you if, if you were afraid to, to ask, you know, for help, then, you know, you really, your heart and soul really wasn't in journalism. Yeah, and and you can't be afraid to to call on those who've been there because that's that's how you really really get your training in that newsroom on yeah. the beat. Go up there, find the story, bring it back, and let's put it together. Agreed, agreed. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for that walk down memory lane. I feel a tad <laughs> bit old. <laughs> <laughs> so when you look back, <laughs> I'm sorry. What you say? No, I say the ink are already in our veins. You know, the ink has made us, has preserved us. Hopefully, yes. The yes hopefully, ink. hopefully. Hopefully. Um, but I, I wouldn't change it for nothing because even to this day, I never, I didn't realize being 17 
and working with 30 and 40 something year olds was a, a milestone and achievement. So looking back, I'm like, wow, that's like, I pat myself on the back that, you know, not only was I welcomed, not the, first of all, the, the team that we had at the NASA garden is unmatched. Like the family yeah. and the camaraderie that we had back then, I never was able to duplicate that in any other working environment that I've been at since then. So I'm glad that that was the blueprint. I'm glad that that was the foundation, but I cherish the team that we had, like the little jokes that we even had, you know, like I can't even tell those jokes now because no one's going to get it. You know? Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, the, the thing with you though, um, I knew cause you know, I, I would constantly defend um, your disposition. I'm like, you know what? this girl, um, she's going to be a, a good journalist. People were like, well, well, she doesn't talk much. I say, well, she's observing, you know, she, she, she's looking, she's learning. And sometimes it's best not to talk much when you enter an environment and you're trying to, to learn, you know, yeah, there's a place and time for all those questions. But if you're looking at other reporters, um, even the whole team, you know, I say, don't worry about that. She, she's observing and she's learning. Yeah. I said, I'm not, now look at you. Yeah, you know? I, so was, I, I was definitely I, a sponge. Yes, I saw that. I saw in you, um, you know, the zeal and the drive. And you weren't afraid to branch out. You did sports, you did feature, you did business. You wrote for every segment of the newspaper. I did. And that's the real, that's the real journalist. Yeah. I remember when we first started. Um, Anthony Cape, when he was the editor at the time, he sent me to do sports for three months. I was like, Mr. Cape, I have no idea. <laughs> he said, apply, apply, apply the same concept, you know, the five W's, who, what, where, when, and why, right? And there's a how somewhere that how is the other W, right? He said, apply the same concept. And so I still grapples with it, right? But I went, because, you know, you go where you're sent. I went and how I how um how I got to interpret a sport like netball <laughs> netball cricket oh, net cricket Oof. basketball the only thing I was really familiar with was basketball you know um so what I did I sat next to someone who knew the game so so this is also how you grow as a journalist yeah right go to the assignment you 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 should not be afraid to speak or to introduce yourself. And so even today in my everyday life, if I'm sitting next to someone, I'm going to start a conversation. You know, if you don't respond, then fine, but I'm going to you start find a someone else. <laughs> Whoever I sit next to, right? right? So when I went to the sporting events, I just looked for someone, either the assistant coach or someone who was aware of the game. And I just asked him what's happening. And that's how I wrote my story. So, it, but after three months, I'm like, escape no more, please. Yes, yeah, <laughs> torture. Because, <laughs> <laughs> like, okay, Ms. Brent, this is really not a fit for me. Um, can right. I get back in hard? You please, please say, sure. So, I had a little touch of sports. Yeah. Um, I did features, and I was also the business editor, which was the biggest challenge for me. Um, because Business is a specialty area. Yes. You have to know markets. You, you have to know what they mean. You have to know um, economy to so a certain extent. Uh, so I, that was a challenge for me. Yeah, and I struggled with business for sure. Yeah, that was a promotion. So I told Mr. Walks, I said, sir, um, you're going to have to give me time to do this. So we said, okay, Lindsay, I'm going on vacation. And when I come back in two weeks, if I like what I see, I'm going to promote you to business editor. So I said, okay. So I say two weeks. I say, don't give me no paper, no nothing yet. Let me just try. This is a trial error, right? So by that time, Martella Matthews came to us. Yes, yes, she, yes, yes. She had, had a business degree. So she was like God sent, right? She had a business degree and I had the writing expertise, right? So we married them both. And so with a little help, from me as an editor, she was able to construct her business stories. And she had all the terminologies and she, she knew how the market worked and she knew what was going on. And so that's how we made the business section work. And so when Mr. Walks came back two weeks later, he said, okay, Lindsay, good work. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, Mr. Walk, where's the paperwork? Let me see. <laughs> I said, I'm not taking 
it close. <laughs> I said, let me let me see it in writing. Right. Let me see what you pay me. Then I'll take it. And so that's how we did it. And I did that for two years. So that was my last position at the Nassau Garden before I left. Business editor. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of pay, um, <laughs> you just reminded me of something else. Like you were you were such a great mentor. Like I I actually feel like I owe you my career, seriously. Um, even after I went off to school and I came back and I started Poetech Group, I started doing some freelance work. I still was like hitting you up like, Lindsay, how much should I charge for this? And how much do you, you think is a low price or is this too low? And I, I was like, boy, I hope, I hope Lindsay don't think like, oh, she's such a nag or she's so annoying or whatever. Like, 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 like I was so happy when I got to the point where I could take my you know, my training wheels off and I could just negotiate prices and rates on my own. Like that was a big deal. But like, you don't know where you're going until someone gives you some kind of guide of, yeah, this is too low, or this is too high and all the other good stuff. So that, that was really helpful. You have to know your worth, you, you know, you go off to school and then you come back and, and you get the experience and the knowledge and the know how, why shouldn't you be paid for that? Yeah. You should sell for no less yeah absolutely i agree okay so speaking about your career what are some of the highlights you would think you would say for yourself or some interviews that really stood out um when you think back on it looking back and sometimes when i when i think back of how i started and those who you know whom i've encountered and interviewed i'm like oh wow i really had an amazing career um, very early in my career, um, in 1991, Terry Waite, um, the former Lebanese hostage, right? Mm. He, you know, he was the Church of England envoy who was um, held hostage in Lebanon from many years, um, 87, I think, to 1991. Well, you know, upon his release, he came to the Bahamas with his family for vacation. And guess who the reporter was from the Nassau Guardian? little old me i mean i was like i was a cub i was still a cub reporter you know that's what you call a cub reporter okay so i'm assigned to go to this interview he's at gray cliff you know and i went um i don't know if i was in i didn't feel any type of way at the moment because you know i'm like i'm here to interview this famous man but as soon as i sat next to him you know, Great Cliff, they had us in, in the lounge chairs, you know, comfortable chairs. As soon as I sat next to him, I was like, a little bit. I have to interview this man who the entire world knows about. Right. And, you know, that that really um, made me, that swelled my head a bit, you know. Because, you know, how <laughs> we have an ego. <laughs> the reporters have an ego, Keisha, and you know about that. But anyway, I felt, um, I felt, you know, like I was, like I arrived, right? You know, this cover interviewing such, you know, such such a man of of, of who the whole world has seen what has happened to him, you know, and upon his release, the whole world was still watching what was going to happen to him right um, thereafter, you know. So that was that was a huge story for me, and I really felt um, the editor. You know, sometimes they test you. You know, some like we say baptized by fire, they, they just throw you in and whether you swim or sink is up to you. And another another um favorite, another memory I have that, that I thought, well, hey, yes, Lindsay, this will really look good on your resume. Or this will really expose you to to the other side of the world. So I go back to school. I go um Cardiff, Wales. Um Mr. Brown was, you know, I thanked him for um, orchestrating that. Um, a young mother, you know, my, my son, my last son, William, he was barely two years old. So sometimes you have to make those decisions um, with your career to go back. And so after I finish um, that course, the, um, the British High Commission here, they arranged for me to do several interviews. One of those places was the Privy Council in London. Here, Lindsay Thompson, going to the Privy Council in London to interview the Lord President of the Council about the Privy Council being the highest court of appeal for the Commonwealth of Thomas. 
So that was really another um, interview that, that stuck out in my career that I'm glad I did. And I'm glad I stayed behind an extra week. And you know, I wanted to come back home to my family. Right. But, you know, some opportunities, you, you just have to take it. Some opportunities, you have to outweigh um, the learning aspect as opposed mm-hmm. to, you know, I can't do it now. I'm going to put it off. But when you're not paying for it, you know, when you're not paying for it and when um, it is something that would enhance your profession and you as a person, you better take it. Right. You find a way to you find a way to make everything else work, but you better seize that opportunity. You know, it right. won't last forever. Right. Right. It. And another another fave another memory that I that I cherish um, was Celindon Pilling, our former prime minister, Lisa Lyndon Pilling. Why I say that? I spent a lot of time with him in nineteen ninety seven, general election. Um, I was assigned to him from the Nassau Guardian, and we went to every nook and cranny in this country. Sometimes rain, you know, we're leaving from the Providence. I'm calling, so Linda, are we going to Cat Island today? Say, yes, Miss Thompson, meet me at the airport, X, Y, Z. Right. And many times, many times I had a, a you know, the Nassau Guardian used to send us with our camera. <laughs> Sometimes if, if the photographer wasn't available. And so, so I saw, I saw him in, in another way. I saw firsthand his interaction with the Bahamian people. I saw his love for this country and the Bahamian people. I, I saw how he, how he just wanted to, because, you know, he died, you know, shortly after. Um, so I saw how he wanted to make those last moments count. You know, mind you, it, it was an election campaign. But you know some of the some of the issues and some of his interaction were were just thank you. You know that that's what I got from it. Some of, some of his interaction um, were you know your Bahamians. You know we have a country to to continue to develop. Right. Um, some of his interaction were just embracing. You know he he was embracing people and and looking on. Um, that, that, that's what I get. So those are some of the, you know, there are lots, but those are some of the, of the three poignant moments in my career that I'm glad I, I did it. Um, much to, to, to many challenges. Did you, you ever been on a three seater or a five seater? <laughs> you ever been? Um, you, I, may, I, I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing, but yes, I have. Pilot and, and, and more, you know, more times than, than than I really should be on on one of, on one of those planes, but yes, <laughs> you know, um, in, in, in weather as well. So I I cherish those items, and of course, um, once I started working in government, um, it also afforded me the opportunity to travel more. Um, I went to Chogum twice, you know, in Malta, and then again in London. Uh, I went to um, CARICOM, you know, Caribbean has a government meeting, and um, I went for further training. So every opportunity was was my focus um, for my career and as a person. Yeah. So you, you have to make sure to take that into consideration as well. And so, yeah, we could talk all night about all kinds of, you know, interviewees, you know, people I've come across who have interviewed. And, and for those, those three right there, uh, really, um, I would say, the turning point in my career, early in my career, and then like in the middle, then in the middle, and then towards, you know, on the other side, being in government. Yeah. Right. Well, your list sounds a lot better than mine. Um, <laughs> on my list, and I was super, super new. I was I was still a sports reporter when I interviewed Brian McKnight. Um, okay. He, he did a, I guess you could say he made an appearance at um, Jeff Rogers' basketball camp. Okay. Um, and when I was in Dallas, I interviewed, which is a funny story, but I, I, I won't, I, I don't want to take up a lot of time, but I, I interviewed, um, oh, what's his name? I can't think of his name now. He, he's from Dallas, Texas. He, he played for the, for the Raptors. Um, he retired shortly after Dwayne Wade, um, but he was on that team with Dwayne Wade and LeBron. So I can't think of his name, but anyway, then I interviewed Monica and I interviewed Evander Holofield. 
I interviewed him when I was in Dallas and I interviewed him around the Hall of Field when he was doing Percy Call on, I want to say, uh, former Prime Minister Perry Christie. I want to say it was his administration. But those, those are on my list. I have celebrities. I don't have world leaders <laughs> <laughs> and world headliners, you know, but you know, whatever. Um, so that's yeah. a really good list. So it's definitely something to aspire to. <laughs> Absolutely, absolutely. You know, you, you're still in the profession, um, even though you, you're doing another side. So you see how multifaceted um, journalism and mass communication, you know, is. So you can go into all aspects of it and you can still, you can still meet the who's who. You can still meet um, those who really need our, our help in getting their stories out. Right. So, you know, you will come across those people and, and you never know. We have mm -hmm. a lot of leaders who come here for conferences and meetings so yeah you know you just as long as you're in the profession um whichever um you know rung of the ladder that you're on you can still run into someone and you can still get that wow story or that story that will probably change you know change the minds of those who are watching and reading and and listening right uh chris bosch that's the name of the nba player who i interviewed in in dallas texas he's from there so hey, kind of, I, only know, hey, I only know the Lakers. <laughs> you mean the Lakers who rated last right now in the Western Conference? Okay, that that's that's not fight. That was good. You you should not be telling nobody you only know the Lakers right now. That's not a no. Well, I know I know a lot of the players, but you know my affinity is, is tied to the Lakers. Okay, understood. <laughs> um, I. I I won't crucify you more than I already have. <laughs> Please, <Okay. don't. laughs> so we're going to play a little game called Plead the Fifth, right? Okay. Um, but before we get into this game, I have one more question. So thinking back on the 30-something years or 30 years of your career, do you have any regrets? Because I have a few that I've learned to get, get over, but do you have any regrets Anything that, you know, you should have went left and, and you went right? Uh, regrets, regrets, regrets. I wouldn't say regrets. Um, I have a, I guess you would call it disappointment, but when I think about it, I think sometimes you just have to move when, when things aren't going your way and you think you're supposed to change, but you really can't. The only thing you can change is you. So, you know, when um, Kalina, I, I'm not casting aspirations on the company at all, but when Kalina bought the NASA Guardian, I felt they lost a great opportunity to maintain the institutional memory of the newspaper. Um, there were right sizing, downsizing, and all the political terms, you know, to be politically racked that they use and still use. Um, yeah, I, th I think that was a missed opportunity to, to really um, keep on the institutional memory, which is so lacking today. Not, not taking away from the editors and the copy editors who are there now. You know, we're, we're in a different times now, right? So I, I think um, that move kind of killed the newspaper a bit. I mean, when, worldwide, when you look at, at newspaper um, writers, um, journalists, they're there until they die, you know. Walter Conkright and, and, and Peter Jennings and those, they're in their 70s and 80s, and, and they're still behind and some, the microphone. Yeah, exactly. And so why I say that is because when you have new reporters who, who come in, they need someone to bounce off. They need someone to hate. Hey, you know, this happened before in 1492 or, or in 1996, this is what happened. So you have to, you have to go deeper into that, you know, and, and um, I guess it's really nothing we could have done, but, but I, I, I wish I, I wish I had made my voice clearer, even though I decided to leave because things were happening in my life that I needed regular hours. Of course, I was burnt out. I was burnt out. After 14 years, I was just burnt out. And so I, I, I thought I, I should have been more vocal in terms of letting them know, 
hey, there's another way to do this. And, um, you know, so it is, it is, or it is what it was, you know, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, think, I think I, I think, I think I, I, I think I could have been more vocal because I, I, I was a passionate um, journalist, or I still am. And being at, at the newspaper was really um, what I felt I was going to do. And so when that started to happen, I, I wish I was more vocal and say, hey, you know, let's ask, ask other people how you should go about this. Not you know, right. those who are looking at the world. But, you know, other than that, um, I, I wish I had learned more photography. Yeah, I, I can take I can take photo. Um, I can manage. I can do a little Photoshop, you know. Um, I wish I had delved more into photography. And just to make myself a little bit more well-rounded, you know, I can do the other yeah. stuff. Um, but and yeah, of course, you have the opportunity to do that. Alrighty, um, let's play a little game. It's very easy. You're gonna have two choices. Um, if we get to a question or a choice that you don't want to answer, you just simply say "plead the fifth. If you can't, if, if you can't make a choice, you say "plead the fifth. So, for instance, um, let me think of something. Uh, uh, apple or orange. <laughs> so you will pick one or the other. If you don't want to pick, you just say plead the fifth and we move on. You ready? Okay. Gotcha. Yep. Okay. Let's go. <laughs> Coffee or tea? Coffee. Okay. Morning. When do you when is the best time for you to write? Morning or evening? Oh. I plead the fifth. Okay. Yeah, it depends. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Okay, I understand. All right, mm -hmm. so <laughs> 90s <laughs> era journalist or today's journalist? Okay. 90s, because, can I explain? 90s, because during that time, we were on the cusp of the innovative, of the innovation that we see today. Um, for instance, the Nassau Guardian, we were the first to have the um, color printer. So that's when we switched from black and white to color. So we were first in the country, maybe in the region, to have um, what, a five or seven color printer whatever, Heidelberg machine, I remember all of that. And so I think to see the transition, to see the transition um, and, and even being a part of it, to see it being a part of it and, and having been trained to do it. Uh, I think, I think, yeah, in the 90s, yeah. Okay, awesome. Um, okay. I struggled with this one because I, I didn't know what I wanted to choose a person or an election. So okay. let me see how I'm gonna phrase this. Hmm. Which one did you enjoy, if you could even say that word, but which one did you enjoy covering when Hubert Ingram, Prime Minister Hubert Ingram was elected or when Prime Minister Perry Christie was elected? Which, which election or which um, election night did you enjoy covering? Well, I would honestly say 1992, because my generation, if you were, if you were 40 and under, mm -hmm. you understood what that meant. Yeah, I mean, I voted before. I remember the first time I voted, I wasn't quite informed. And then I went off to school. I voted and left. I, I, had, I, I had no in-depth. Um, information to make an informed decision. And even though taking nothing from Solinden, I think by the time 1992 came around, those of us who were, you know, like I say, 40 and under, we, we saw it as our time. 
Right. We saw it as our time to make that change for ourselves and our children and children's children. Being a, a reporter at the time, <clears throat> it was exciting because we, we were so galvanized. I mean, so uh, our thirst, not just for, for an outcome, I just think covering it, our thirst, those of us who were in the newsroom at the time, that was probably our first time covering an election to that mm -hmm. extent. Okay. We, we, we toiled long and hard. We woke up early to vote and then we went back into the newsroom. So our, our day started from maybe 6 a.m. that 6 a.m. Until 6 a.m. <laughs> exactly. So, 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 so you go and you vote. You, vote, you cast your vote. You head back into the newsroom because that's where you will be for the, for the rest of the night. And like you say, well into the next morning. And so the feeling of actually witnessing that change, I think that that's another key element of it. We actually witnessed a change that meant something to us. Because we were children, <laughs> we were children, um, you know, 1967, or, you know, some of us probably weren't even born then. So we had, we, we had no inkling, <laughs> we had no idea, we, we couldn't even conceive what that meant. And, and even though the general election before 92, we, we still didn't know, some of us were still in high school or just scooting off to college or go somewhere. Right. So for us to actually feel it, experience it, report it, you know, that's the key, report it. So we were in the newsroom doing the tallies. We're in the newsroom um, writing stories, you know, trying to get the big headline. And so I, I think, yeah, that was really um, the turning point for right. so many, for that generation as a whole. And for those who were gathering news at that point, who who understood more of what that meant, because the prior to that, of it. Yeah, prior to that, you know, we were in the newsroom and we were at the rallies and we're gathering all these interviews and we were we were interviewing um, institutional memories. You know, we were picking at those and, and we were talking to um, politicians, you know, on both sides. And so we had we had a clearer view. Uh, we had a deeper insight, and we had we actually witnessed it. We were part of the change, and so that's that's the difference right there. We were part of that change, and we were also recording that change. So that that was a dual yeah experience. I don't know how else to describe it. You yeah, I, I I completely get it. I I definitely understand what you're saying. Um, like you you. You feel this extra obligation as well as a privilege to be, have a front row seat to this transitioning or passing of a baton, and and it's it's history at the end of the day too. So to be no, a part of that, and in a way you are ushering that change because without you, how would we even know what's going on? You know, social media wasn't invented then, was it? Oh, no, no, social media wasn't invented yet. So. It wasn't how it how it is today. No. And um, you know, so so it was a dual thing. We we were part of the change in terms of voting and we were part of the change in terms of um reporting and giving the public the information in order to make an informed decision right about their future. Right. So so that that's powerful. I, I don't think I don't think we'd ever feel that again in terms of an election, an election, and coverage. Yeah, I agree. Yeah. Unless it's like a woman, unless we finally elect a woman in that driver's seat. Lord, we pray and we pray and we pray. But <laughs> until such time, I, I, I completely understand that, and I've heard other journalists describe other moments like that too, like you know, um, President Barack Obama being you mm -hmm. know elected for the first time, being sworn in, and all of that other good stuff. It's like an out of body experience in a way. Um, so yes. I, I absolutely completely get your point of view for sure. Um, for those of you, well, the person <laughs> who is still joining, who is still tuned in, thank you so much. Um, for those of you who are on the rebroadcast, 
Again, this is The Crafts, which is Candid Conversations with Creatives. I am Kashan Kalmo, President and Creative, Creative Director for Poitia Group. And my special guest is someone who has been a mentor for me in my journalism career. But even more than that, she's a seasoned journalist and a communications public a communication strategist in Lindsay Thompson. Thank you so much for your time. This, is such, this has been such a good conversation so far. I thoroughly enjoyed it. Great. Uh, I want to switch gears a little bit. Um, if you have any questions, those who are tuned in, please um, use the comment box or the little question icon at the very bottom. Um, and we'll be happy to pose your questions to Lindsay. Um, just switching gears a little bit to pub to be to publicists and that career and, and what you do for the government, and I'm sure you've done for many personal brands. Um, what are three things, three major things that publicists should know, particularly as it relates to engaging with journalists and others in, in the media industry? Okay, I think I hold on. Did I lose one second, Tasha? No problem. Um, a lot of people who are in the PR industry, like myself. Um, I lean heavily on the fact that I not only have been in the shoes of a journalist, but I also have relationships with people who are still in journalism, people who I may have worked with in some form or fashion. So I have that kind of an advantage, but for those who may not have that particular advantage, um, or who just may be new in that role as a publicist, what are three things, three major things that you see that publicists do that they probably shouldn't do, any mistakes that they make or any advice that you may have? Um, three major points that you can make. I think um, one of the things is publicists think that because let's, for example, I work for a newspaper, that they think they, they, that I can get their clients, you know, discounts, you know, I, they think I can discounts. get their clients. In, into into the paper without them having to do any work. Ah, uh -uh. <laughs> okay, Sharon, come on. What you think about that? Are you, you serious? Know? People really calling you and asking for discounts? That has happened. It may not happen anymore, but that used to happen. You're getting paid to do a job, but you wow. want me to, but you want me to see what I can do to get your client in the paper. That that used to happen. I, I'm not, I'm not a newspaper anymore. Right. So maybe. You know, I hope that, that I hope that that's not still happening. I don't. I'm not trying to get someone to lose their job over placement in the paper. Wow. I think. I, yeah, that that used to happen. Um, like I say, I'm not at the newspaper anymore. It so it it know. it may very well still be happening. I mean, maybe sure. We're a small community. <laughs> And um, I, I think based on um, also publicists, it is their job to sell their clients. So when you're, when you're putting together an event, you're supposed to come on with all the information, you know, the biography, um, the backstory, the, um, about the event, every single thing the journalists need to properly write that story to properly um, put your clients in the best possible light. So when you show up at an event, you know, you can here, Ms. Thompson, you give me, give me either hard copy or email. So you give me everything I need so I can properly portray your clients in the best possible light of what is going on here. So I think, um, so what was this thing? We're supposed to do that. We know we're coming to a scene, we're coming to an event, and we basically know who the client is, what they're all about. No, I don't. I, I just come here to write a story. I, I might, I might be coming uh, as a government and publicist. I know the government, yeah. So in essence, I am also a publicist. I'm the government publicist, so I should be able to tell you about the client, the government, and you're supposed to be able to tell me about your client, whomever or whatever it is. And so that's. That's another um, thing I, I believe publicists think, you know, oh, well, the journalists, oh, they know. No, we don't. Your client is paying you to sell them. And so you're supposed to come prepared to sell them to us. Yeah. Agreed. Okay. 
Um, yeah, I completely, un- I completely agree with that. Um, a lot of times, even if the client might be, you know, disorganized or not have all of their stars in a row, it is your job as a publicist to also be like, hey, this could very well be no news, old news tomorrow. You know, the news cycle changes so quickly, so often. You know, we just got off the um, uh, Duke and Duchess news cycle. It's probably going to be something else today, tomorrow. There's no way to dictate it. So, you know, try, first of all, be realistic too. Sometimes you're not going to get in Monday's or Thursday's paper just because it's the hardest or the the biggest um, circulation. You know, you, you, sometimes you have to be realistic on what your story is. Um, so that's that. And then also, you know, try to be as organized as possible so that you keep good relationships with the journalists. Um, you know, I have personally been in situations where, you know, obviously it was out of my control and I had to profusely apologize to the reporter or to the editor. And I always have to make a mental note, baby girl, next time you have to call this person, have your together you know because you don't want to you don't want to give that reputation that oh yeah she always late oh yeah she never organized or you know the story is going to be old they're they're going to pitch the story and it can take them two weeks just to give them the give them a a press release you know you always want to make sure that you keep um your client happy but your relationships have to be solid too you don't you don't want to have to call them and then they're ignoring your emails that kind of relationship is never gonna you know equal success um Absolutely. So you either you either give us the information beforehand, you know, so we come with the knowledge. And if anything else, you know, we can ask extra questions about, you know, the client, whether it's a person or a product. So all you have it ready once we arrive at the at the assignment. Right. Um, but the key is for us not to leave without having that information. Because if we we have a, we already started to craft the story in our minds. Exactly. And, and exactly. you would be doing your client a disservice if you don't accommodate the media as much as possible so we can have a well-rounded um, story from the event. And we all win. You know, the other side, when I, and you definitely win. You get paid for sure. You get paid for sure. Yeah, for sure. Okay, I think that those are... are pretty good advice, um, especially for someone who may be starting out in PR or, like I said, in the publicist role. Um, for, I think, Melissa, I don't know if Melissa is the person that's on. Did you have any questions for Lindsay or any comments or whomever is on? <laughs> if you have any questions or comments. Um, while we wait for the question, Lindsay, any advice for you know, journalists who may be in college or, get, you know, getting that extra um, course in to, you know, strengthen their skill set or anyone who may be new in the industry, any advice for them? Well, you know, today it's not the same when I started or, or you started, even though you started, it's not the same. But I'm thinking if you if you decided that journalists, journalism or mass media mass communication is, is what you want to do um you have to be hungry for it you have to have a passion it, it, it's a career it's, it's not a job so you have to see it as a career meaning this is what you're going to do for the rest of probably the most part of your life um um until at which age you decide to retire and even then you know it probably goes beyond but you have to be hungry for it you have to have a passion for it. And um, you have to be able to weather the storm. If you're thin skinned, I'm sorry. You have to, it's not for you. It's not. You will get, you will get discouraged a lot if, if you let it impact you in such a way. You'll be talked about. People will, will say you can't write, you can't do this. Um, people will see you as um, an opportunist. So you're going to have to decide, this is my career. This is what I'm going to do. And you have to have a passion for the truth, you know, accuracy, honest, (laughs) responsibility. You have to have good ethics. You know, nobody wants a journalist who fabricates a story, who 
was not honest, was not accurate. So when you hear the name John Doe, oh, him? No, we're not going to talk to him. We're going to talk to Jane Doe. We're going to talk to Harry or, or Sally. Right. You know, once someone hears your name, yes, I know that journalist. Okay? Yes, I, I know that person in the profession. I don't mind sitting down with Lindsay Thompson, Ishan Poitier. I don't mind sitting down with them and giving them that interview. Mm -hmm. And you have to protect your sources. That, that's another thing when you come into the profession. It, it, it's not a, a secret for you to go and share with someone else. Even your editor. I, I had to tell my editor the other day when I was at the paper, you're just going to have to trust me on who the person is. And so, but you have to be at such a level in the profession for your editor to even trust you um, that for not divulging your right. So trust is paramount. Trust, accuracy, and honesty. So if you're not prepared to do those, even, even within yourself as a person, I'm sorry, you need to go look somewhere else. So once you decide, I'm going to be a, a reporter, um, whatever, in the profession, you have to have those principles about you. And love, first of all, you know, the pay, I don't know what the pay is now. I'm too, I'm too embarrassed to tell you what my first paycheck was. I was proud of my first paycheck. I was a teenager, so I was like, hey, going shopping. I just came home from school and, you know, a little bit of knowledge in my head and, and this. <laughs> but, but, you know, if I didn't love it, no, seriously, though, if I didn't love it, <laughs> if I didn't have the passion and the hunger to be a journalist, I would not have stayed. I'd have, I'd have been doing something else different today. But it, it consumed me. You remember I telling you? It oh, yeah. It definitely me. does. It does. It does. I wanted to be, I wanted to be the best I could possibly be at it. And so I just decided this is going to be my career. And I did everything possible to improve it. I learned from those who were in the field. I didn't care if they were the guardian or not. <laughs> if I saw you had something to teach me, I was going to ask you. I don't care if you had the Tribune, which was our competition. I didn't bother me because I know. I, I, I didn't know it all. So I know someone else could, you know, who was able to teach me. So, so whether you're, you're, you're going to learn from someone else, you have to have the drive and the passion and the love yeah, and you know, the knowledge and the, the willingness to take it all. Because you will be criticized, you will be bombarded. Look at the journalists today, you know. Mind you, um, I'm not bashing anyone, but we can improve a bit. When I say we, I mean the profession. We could improve a bit on our on our skills, on our approach to getting the story. Uh, we could improve more on digging deeper, because you know if you if you come across a story today, that happened before. I I a thousand percent agree with you, and it's it, unfortunately it's been dragged on for so long. I don't even read the paper anymore unless. I'm looking for a story for my client or I'm looking for something. I don't pick up the paper to be like, oh, let me see what's going on in the world today. I don't do that. That was 1492 from the Columbus game to, 2000, to 2022. That story, that incident happened before. So you have to know someone who probably knew about it or, you know, that's what I talk about institutional memory or go through your archives. Brother kill brother happened before. For people, you know, I'm just throwing things out here. I, I'm not. No, I got you. On it. Any, um, you know, uh, you know, someone was reelected. You know, it, it happened before. Very rarely we have some new things that come about. Like for, for now, we have so many women in parliament. That's new. Yeah, that's new. So things like that, you can tell what's new and what has happened before. And so sometimes when you, when but the, you I go, think, I think the point, I feel like the point you're trying to make is the fact checking though. It's the going to an event and someone tells you 
you know, we, this is now the fifth um, female house uh, uh, chair of the House of Assembly. I mean, house, um, house speaker. And you'd be like, okay. And you write it down as the fifth. Did you even check? <laughs> Did you even, you know, like you say, do the, the diving into the archives and, or even lean on someone to be like, hey, can you confirm that this is true? Um, yeah. Like it's, 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 it's funny because if I had not worked with, you know, the people that you mentioned before, you know, the Vanessa Clarks, the Lakeisha McSweeney's and, you know, people who took the time to go into the archives and that was a normal thing. If that had yes. if I hadn't seen that as being a normal thing, I would think that normal is actually, like I said, going to an event, hearing a speech. And you go back to your desk and you just type up what they said in the speech. You didn't actually craft a story. That's not, that's reporting. Right. That's not journalism. You know, mm -hmm. so that act of going the extra mile, we used to call it lazy journalism, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. But going that extra mile to get a backstory, to think, what is my competition not going to do? Who is my competition not going to talk to? You know, getting both sides of the story. Um, that whole, I, I, I'm, I'm not saying that, that it, it's not happening. Um, I'm saying that I get the impression that it's not happening as far as staking out somebody um, and being relentless for a story, calling them. And even if you think you, you're nagging them, not being satisfied with no comment, not being satisfied with them just avoiding your calls. I mean, technology has grown so much since the time that we were in the newsroom. I would think that they would have more um, resources to really dig. I'm sure they can do them all um, digital now, uh, as opposed to you know, being so manual. But right. you know, it, 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 it's, it's simple. It, it's a calling. You know, people will talk about teachers and, and other profession. It's a calling. You have to feel it in your belly. You, you have to want it. Um, the passion, the drive, the truth, um, the commitment, because you know, that there's long hours. Whether you're working physically in the newsroom, are you working from home? You know, there's still long hours. So you have to be willing to put that in. Honesty, accuracy, responsibility, ethics, you know, those are, are some of the, I mean, the hallmark, the tenets, um, the, the, the benchmark, <laughs> benchmark if, you prefer, if you want to go into the field, if you right. really, really have to have a passion and a drive for it. That, that's, that's all I can say. Yeah. You know, I think that if, if not, it's not for you. If yeah. not. Do something else. Yeah. Do something else. <laughs> yes, I agree a thousand percent. Um, so, I mean, it, it has to make sense. Like you said, you have to feel it in your belly for sure. Um, yes. I don't have any other questions. I, I, I don't think the person who is viewing is, is going to ask any questions. They're probably just watching um, or just listening anyway. Um, but if they, if you have any questions, anyone who's watching the rebroadcast, please, um, I'm going to tag Lindsay in the post so you can go ahead and, and DM her or send her a message or you can send us a message and I'll be more than happy to pass it on to her. But, um, Lindsay, thank you so, so much for joining. Thank you so much for carving out some time to talk with us. I love talking journalism with you. I, I, I love having those little flashbacks of us in the newsroom. I mean, and, I, and you know what? Those memories only belong to us because they've already <laughs> gutted out that newsroom and is now a radio station there. So <laughs> only a few of us can remember what that newsroom looked like. But it, 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 it has changed. Because, you know, we, we used to be downstairs and we went upstairs. Right. Even, even upstairs, even upstairs now has changed. Yeah. Yeah. When I was there, we were upstairs. I, I don't know anything about downstairs. Change. Yeah, we were right. upstairs, but left, but that has changed, you know. Right. And around the time that I was when I was going off to school was when they were talking about going where they are now, that little space where they are now. That was that was just that was just a conversation. I remember when when we went there to tour the space, and I remember that was about probably two weeks or three weeks before I was about to jet off to Dallas um, to get my degree. So. <laughs> Yeah, that, that newsroom exists only in our memories now. That's crazy. Siobhan Moss is still there. Sheldon Longley. Yes. yes. Still there. Um, who else do we know that's still there? 
Well, I, I only, the only person who I, who I, um, interact with on a regular basis is Naya Jones. Cause that's who I book my ads okay. with or, um, anything like that for my clients. That's who I, that's my go-to person to be getting stuff done. Yeah. <laughs> Gilbert Francis is still there. Gilbert Francis is still there. Yes. Yes. I see him every once in a while. Mm-hmm. Who else? I think that's about it from that era. A lot of the girl, a lot of the ladies from the sales team are still there. Some of the ready yes. people. Some from Prima is still there. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, I I applaud them. I don't know. I I remember when I when I was there, I had aspirations to be an editor, like you. Mm-hmm. But <laughs> after a while, I realized that's a big sacrifice. So that I kind of like shied away from it after a while. One more experience before we go. All right. Also, okay, there was business editor, sports editor, and Lonella Gilbert. She was Mr. Capron's associate editor. But at some point, they put all of us in the mix on the rotation. So I would take one weekend, you know, the editor for the weekend. Because, you know, Mr. Capron, he I think I remember that. Yes. Yes, I do remember that. Rotate. You know, we had to rotate. I you know the experience uh, is invaluable, but let me tell you, that is a lot of pressure. <laughs> Can you imagine? You are the editor for the weekend. Just you. You are the editor for the weekend. So when it came, when it was my turn, I, I mean, I saw it happening, right? But you really didn't expect until you actually going through it. So I'm the editor for the weekend. Every single section. Every single section. You have Proof to read. Off. You're coming up with headlines. <laughs> you have to sign off on every single section. You had to make sure down in composition. I mean, it's a whole, the whole production. Look, that's on my resume. I would, I would never throw an experience away for nothing. Okay. So I know, I know about newspaper production as well. And then you have to go down into the press room downstairs underneath, you know, in the belly, in the belly of the newspaper. You had to go down there and see the first print come off the press and make sure, make sure that <laughs> unbelievable. It, and it, that's like, like, that's like three o'clock in the morning, no? Yes. Oh, uh, um, hopefully it's earlier. Yeah. By the time it's midnight, 1 a.m., 2 a.m. roll around, you should have, you should have already had that first, that first run. So I you just, go down and you cut it right. and you have to start off. And that was my experience as as an as an editor, not business editor, as an editor, because you really have to check every single aspect of that newspaper. Yeah, and, and I I don't I don't envy that at all, at all. And you sacrifice that, like 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 when you talked about balance, you sacrifice so much of your personal life. Yes, for yes, you do. You know, mm-mm. So you I, made, I made the right choice. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Money, right? <laughs> but, but you know, so can you imagine those who are still there and can be a dames toiling away um, long hours in the newsroom and having to oversee, you know, uh, the production of the newspaper? Mind you, there are other editors for different sections, but the buck stops with the managing editor. Those who have to sign off on those papers and make sure they are correct. So, you know, I, the experience is invaluable and I would not change it for anything. So if I were to go anywhere in the world, I, I can, I have newspaper production um, experience, you know. I understand. That's how I was yeah. when I went off to school. I proudly put, you know, paginating on my uh, resume. I don't even know if, if they still use Quark Express, but I have that on my resume as well. <laughs> I put it all on there. You know, photography, <laughs> the fact that I wrote for different sections and all that other good stuff. Because, you know, at that point, you're just trying to, like, grab any type of skill you could throw on your resume back then. But um, yeah, it, it is a, a valuable experience, even if you don't use it right now. I mean, put it on there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. Uh, thank you so much for this glorious trip down memory lane. I mean, I really mm-hmm. feel old. Thank you so much, Lynn. <laughs> But, I mean, it was a good trip. It was a good trip. I would say that. Um, 
it's always good to be nostalgic. You, you never know where you're going until you remember where you came from, as the adage I says, see. right? So um, thank you so much again for your time. I really, really appreciate it. We got to catch up more, though. We really do. We, yeah, hey, we need sure. that balance. <laughs> coffee dinner lunch yes and thank you for having me um i'm glad i was able to um get some of this stuff out of my head uh and hopefully someone who's listening would um, want to venture into journalism we have a whole um school of journalism at the university of the bahamas and if any of them were listening and watching hopefully um that would further you know seal their zest for yeah. It's a fourth estate. We have to, we have to um, guard what we say, what we do, and um, always, always present the information so others can make an informed decision. Yes. Absolutely, that's our job. That's our job. Yes, I agree. Oh, uh, thank you so much for those closing and last words. Um, again, thank you so much for your time, Lindsay. Um, I'll definitely reach out to you sometime next week for us to catch up, really catch up, catch up. Um, but thank sure. you all for tuning in. Um, and if, again, if you have any questions for Lindsay, please send her a DM or send us a DM and we'll be more than happy to answer your question or even reply to your comment if you have one. Um, this is the last installment of the Craft the Women's History Month edition. Uh, we'll have a brand new creative next month, a brand new group of creatives next month. So please tune in. Again, it has been my pleasure to host you. My name is Kishan Palmer. Until we talk again. Good night. Bye, Kishan. Bye. <laughs>